Well, could not be more excited about uh, where, where we are today. We're actually beginning a journey through the, excuse me, through Psalm 23. And uh, just a heads up, it's going to be a slow roll, in, like in real time, verse by verse. Uh, Psalm 23 is six verses, so we're going to be together six to eight weeks. We're not, we're still working through it. Uh, but I, I love it. I, I would imagine if you've been in a space like this before, you've probably read Psalm 23 or you know Psalm 23, you've heard it, or maybe you've been to a funeral and you've heard it read to you, or maybe you are in a, in a season of your life where Psalm 23 is kind of a go-to for you when you're in a, a place of of loss and you need deep comfort or you just need to, to know that God's near you, Psalm 23 might, might be your go-to. Let me, let me tell you what, what I'm most excited about though in, in this series is we're going to invite every person in our house to memorize Psalm 23. Yeah, thank you. Hello, and and obviously this is a this is a a, a major theme in, in my life and my wife's life of memorizing Scripture and letting His Word like drench us. But we're going to invite you to memorize Psalm 23. Some of you, it's going to be a quick endeavor. Some of you, it's going to be, you're going to take all six or seven weeks because you're new to scripture memory. But what, what I want to invite you to do is to, to hold on to this card. Uh, I want you to put this on your mirror, put it in your car. When I memorize scripture, I, I memorize scripture every week. I put it on a little note card and don't do this. I put it in where my speedometer is. <laughs> And so there's some problems there, but that's where I'm like, okay, I'm going to see that every time I get in my car. Um, and so we're, we're, we're grateful that, that this is, this is going to, there's no greater endeavor for us as the people of God to memorize the, the promises of God and let the, the promise of God go down into the hearts of God's people. This is where things happen for us. So uh, let, me, let me begin this way. A um, hundred years ago, uh, America was preparing for what we would later call the Dust Bowl. Now, if you're like me and you, you're not really into college football, you might hear Dust Bowl and hear, oh, like it's the Tostitos Bowl or it's like the Peach Bowl. No, the, the Dust Bowl is widely considered the worst environmental tragedy in American history that, that many of you probably never heard of. Spanning eight years, uh, going uh, from the 1920s all the way into... Uh, the, the 1930s, and what would happen is there would be these things called black blizzards. I think there's a, a picture here of a black blizzard. They'd span 200 miles wide, 2,000 feet into the air, and 65 miles an hour, pushing dust and sand and dirt. It, it was not unusual that the force of these storms would peel the paint off of cars and of homes. In fact, if you got caught in a black blizzard, it, it would not have been unusual for for you to go blind or for you to suffocate to death, just even a few feet from the front door of your own home. Uh, and where, where these were most common, that's uh, mostly in Colorado, Oklahoma, Texas, New Mexico, Kansas, Nebraska. Uh, Texas, of course, got it the worst, if you know anything about history. Um, and the reason is these black blizzards that they would blow through and it was, it was like a, a death march. Everything in the path of the, the black blizzard would die. In fact, they, they would operate like snow blizzards. If, if I'm from the north, officially, originally, and if you've ever been in a, a blizzard, there are what's called snow drifts, where these massive hills of snow would overtake homes and cars, very dangerous. And uh, these black blizzards would have drifts. And so there would be massive, I think there's a picture here, where this, these, this sand and dirt would cover over entire houses, fences. And so what would happen is that cows, this is mostly in Texas, cows would then be able to get out of their fence by walking over the hills and then they would be wandering off from safety. And, and again, it would be not have been unusual for the cows when a black blizzard struck for them to go blind and then for them to suffocate to death. So entire herds of cattle were, were killed off during these, these black blizzards. Um, and then of course, this is, this is you know, probably what is most devastating is that, um, that people, um, besides the cows dying, like 7,000 people during these eight years died of what they called uh, dust pneumonia. And so what would happen is, is these, black, these black blizzards would blow and the dust and the dirt would, would 
blow through the cracks and the crevices of the homes. Their homes were not built like ours are today. And so it would not have been unusual for a a father to keep a shovel inside the house so that in the morning he would shovel out, you know, four or five pounds of dirt and sand that had gotten in. They would take... um, Uh, sheets and pillowcases and they would soak them with water. They would cover the windows, cover the doors just to keep their family safe. And and so you, you, again, if you you can imagine scores of people, millions of people are leaving this part of the country just to keep their family alive. And then I forgot to mention, this is during the great depression. So uh, two and a half million people left Texas and Oklahoma and they went West to California where work was. And California, and if you've ever read Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath, you've you've read about this. They would have these signs in California and on all the the businesses that said, no dogs, no Okies. Okie was a slur that that talked about, represented the people that came came from that region. In fact, Timothy Egan, who's uh, written a book called The Worst Hard Time, it's a biography of the Dust Bowl, it's a a great book. He tells about a a woman who... uh, she had to bury her mother and her five-year-old daughter on the same day. They both died of, of dust pneumonia on April 14th, 1935. So you can imagine, she's at this funeral. There's a regular-sized uh, coffin. There's a child-sized coffin. And, and she's thinking, okay, my past is gone and my future is gone. And the only bright spot of, of that day is that it was clear blue skies, not a storm in sight until there was. Because on that day, April 14th, 1935, marks the worst black blizzard in American history. Blew all the way from Montana and the Dakotas, blowing east, and it blows all the way into New York City. So bad was the storm, people that lived in New York City say you couldn't even see the Empire State Building. Continues to blow into Washington, D.C. There were uh, Uh, hundreds of pounds of dirt that blew into the Capitol buildings, into the White House. It continued to blow 250 miles off the eastern seaboard onto boats. Now, the worst part about the Dust Bowl, this is what's so crazy, was not the static electricity. I mean, though, that was bad. Barbed wire fences would glow blue. The worst part about the, the Dust Bowl was not the jackrabbits. Counterintuitively, Um, all of the predators during these black blizzards died off, but the jackrabbits lived underground, so they survived. And the jackrabbits, they multiplied like like well rabbits right and and they they would would descend onto these towns into these cities looking for green grass and it was like a biblical plague in fact one story that tim egan says is that 30 one one uh city records it was chicago that thirty thousand. no not chicago anyway it was thirty thousand bunnies descended on the city and and all the people they thought it was a biblical plague and they came out with shovels and pitchforks and they killed all the bunnies. There's pictures in the book of thousands of bunny rabbits in the middle of the streets, just mounds dead. But that, that's not the worst part. The worst part about the Dust Bowl is not the barbed wire glowing blue, wasn't the jackrabbits. The worst part is that it was 100% preventable because the Dust Bowl was actually man-made. I tell you that because after the Civil War, The Homestead Act of 1909 made it possible for any person that wanted to go west and to become a farmer, they would be given a track of land. And by manifest destiny, they could just pursue the American dream. And so if you know any American history, millions of people went west. And as you'd also imagine, because you're a human, you know the best tracks of land went really fast to the wealthy and to the corporations. And so the, the, the normal guy that was going out west that he was given a track of land and called the, the, the Great Prairie. And the Great Prairie was, was millions and millions of acres of green grass. And this is where historically the bison grazed. But the bison were long gone because the white man killed them off. And then the Native Americans were brutally taken off that same land, put in, in their own little spaces. And so now these, these would-be farmers show up to millions and millions of acres and they're just looking at grass and they don't know what to do. Now, luckily for them, technology had just caught up and what was just invented was the John Deere tractor. 
And if you had just a little bit of money, you could buy a John Deere tractor and you could become a farmer. And so that's exactly what they did. And so they bought these, these tractors and these combines and they tilled up 10 million acres of grass and they planted wheat. And if you know, again, if you know anything about, if you know anything about farming, you probably know more than, than these farmers. Okay. They didn't know anything about farming. And the reason I know that is because they, they, if they were farmers, they would have known that they just planted wheat in the Great Plains that has long cycles of drought. And they just planted wheat in one of the longest drought seasons in American history. And so within about three weeks, all of the wheat that grew up died because it has tiny little roots. And what was exposed was 10 million acres of dirt that historically for thousands of years have been held down by prairie grass. But now all of a sudden the wind was blowing and catch this, a billion tons of dirt was blown across the Americas. And we suffered for an entire generation for it. And I tell you that because that's the parable of our generation. Whatever generation you're in, that's our parable. That's our story. Because we live blind in our 20s and we pay for it in our 30s. We live blind in our 30s, we pay for it in our 40s. We live blind in our 40s, we pay for it in our 50s. We live blind in our 50s, pay for it in our 60s. Even if you think you're wise in your, you're blind, or wise in your 60s, you're blind in your 60s, you're gonna pay for it in your 70s. Because as humans, it's part of the human condition, we are perpetually blind and arrogant and we think we can do whatever we want in the here and now and just think somewhere in the future we can pay the bill. But if you've been on the planet longer than 15 minutes, like you know that's not true. And so there's this deep part of us that knows we are desperate for a perfect shepherd to lead us. But here's the thing, this is where we need to get clarity. Everybody has a shepherd. I mean, when God made us, he knew that we were not designed to be self-sufficient. We were designed to be led by someone. And so every person in the room, even if you're here and you're not a Christian, you've got a shepherd. I mean, you may be your shepherd. You, you might be the person that thinks you, you're the smartest person on the planet and you can lead you to still waters and greener grass. You think you can restore your soul. Others of you, most of us, it's someone else. It's, a, it's another real person on the planet. It's a, you know, it's an influencer. Or it's a famous person. Maybe it's a pastor. And again, we, we've all got people that we, we say, they're gonna be my shepherd. But what David's gonna do in these six or seven weeks together, he's gonna show us. His eyes were opened to the reality, the spiritual reality that there is a perfect and good shepherd that is designed from before the beginning to lead us to green pastures, to still waters, a place where he can restore our soul. So we're gonna jump in. Now, before we do that, we're gonna read Psalm 23, okay? Now, let me tell you why we're gonna do this. We're gonna read this every week together. And this is why everybody was given one. And my hope is that as, as we read this, this is going to begin to, to get down in the deep places. When, when I first, I read a book on Psalm 23 several years ago by one of my favorite guys, a guy named Dallas Willard. And then I later read a book by one of his disciples, a guy named John Mark Comer. And I, I realized Psalm 23 is not primarily a psalm of comfort. Psalm 23 is a psalm and a prayer of dependence. And so when I, when I read that second book, I, I began to pray Psalm 23 most mornings. Now, not every morning, but four out of seven mornings. When, when I'm getting up, Amy's usually out of the bed. She's a very early riser. So I'm in the bed and I, I literally, I can just say it. Now, if your spouse is still in, in the bed, like you can just whisper it. Or if you're alone, you can just, you can shout it to the rooftops. But what, the reason this is, is so good is before you, your feet hit the, the ground, this is the kind of prayer you want to pray. It's not a prayer of like, God, make things happen for me. God, I got this meeting. God, fix this deal. It's a prayer of dependence. And, and this is what I want us to read together. So we're going to read it aloud together. And if you're new to church and you're like, I cannot believe they're making me read, read aloud. What did you expect? You're coming to church. We're going to do some spiritual things. Okay. Let's read this together. It says this. Let's, let's begin. You ready? We all going to do this together? Don't be a rebel and be like, I'm not reading it. You can't tell me what to do. Here we go. Psalm 23, verse one. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. 
He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. If you come from a liturgical background, that would be when we'd say, that's the word of the Lord. And you'd say, amen. We might do that for these six weeks. I don't know. Okay. Verse one, you guys ready? I love this so much. I love this so much. We're going to do an overview today. And this is just going to get better every week. Psalm 23, verse one. Here's, here's what David says. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. Now, just for clarity, I, I, I don't think David is affirming the plurality of shepherds. I think what he's saying is like, the Lord is my shepherd. Now, you've got another shepherd, but I'm telling you, the Lord is my shepherd and he's a perfect shepherd. And I know he's a perfect shepherd because I shall not want. Now, another translation that I prefer for this little part of the verse says, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. How can a person say, I lack nothing? Well, because the Lord is my shepherd. <laughs> and because he's a perfect shepherd, he has made sure that I lack nothing. Now, I don't know if, if you caught it, it says that he, for starters, he makes us lie down in green pastures. And he leads us beside still waters and he restores my soul. But did you catch the, he makes me lie down? I mean, some of you, you heard that and you're like, well, he can't make me. Nobody can make me do anything. Well, I'm telling you, this shepherd makes us do some things. That's part of being in relationship with the shepherd. And the authority that he has to make us do some things is that he paid a ransom for you. He paid a price for you and for me. And the proof is in the scars on his hands and his feet and his side and his head. And he knows as sheep, that's the moniker that God gives us, as sheep, we're going to regularly go off the path. When we go off the path, things are going to go bad for us. And so he's going to make us do some things. Now, as a, as a parent, we get this, right? I mean, if, if you have small children, you're like, yeah, heck yeah, I'm going to make them do some things. I mean, like, I'm not going to let my four-year-old make life decisions. I'm going to let my four-year-old know that I'm a good parent, that I love them, I'm out for their good, so I'm going to make them do some things. And every parent in the room is like, amen to that. But ironically, then you walk out of the room as an adult, and you're like, but nobody's going to tell me what to do. And so clearly, this is not a feel-good psalm, Right? I mean, if it was a feel-good psalm, and I know we think it's a feel-good psalm because we hear it at funerals and, and it's, it's, it's a comfort to us, but it's not a feel-good psalm. If, if it was a psalm of feel-good, the, the way that we'd want it to be read or written today, if, 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 if somebody was writing it today, I mean, we're so overly sensitive. Oh my goodness, we're so overly sensitive. If, if somebody was writing this today, what we'd want to hear is, the Lord soothes me. And he gently tickles my back. I like my wife to do that. He, he gently tickles my back and he whispers in my ear that, that John, every broken place is fine. Your rebellion against me, it's okay. You're gonna get there. Like, no, that, that would be what we would want in, in a comforting psalm. But it, it's clearly, it's not designed to do that. Because it says he makes me. And then he leads me, and then he restores me, and then he guides me along paths of righteousness. I don't, I don't know if, if how you read that. I read that. It's so encouraging because it's like seeds of revival for us. Because if you want to be rescued out of your wasteland, if you want to be rescued out of the dust bowl of your own making, and everybody's got one, if you want to be rescued, then you have to be made and led and restored and guided to paths of righteousness. And the one leading us is not you because you're blind. The one leading us is the perfect shepherd. His name is Jesus. And you can read about him in John chapter 10 as the good shepherd. But let's keep going. David is, is describing what it means to be shepherded by God. 
He says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So he comforts me. Do you know how he comforts us? It's not because he gives us a big hug, though he does draw near to us. And maybe he will hug you, but that's not primarily how God comforts us. The way that he comforts us is by giving us a confidence that he's our defender. Our shepherd is the one with the rod and the staff. And so what's comforting to me is that I don't have to carry a rod and a staff because my shepherd carries a rod and a staff. He goes on, he says, and you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I can't wait for that one. You anoint my head with oil. Do you know what that means? It means he blesses you. Like a father blesses a son and a daughter. And he's like, there's nothing you can do to disappoint me. When you're in the family, there's no such thing as disappointment. Now there's disobedience, but there's not disappointment because you're in Christ. And I've anointed you as a son and a daughter. You're mine. He goes on, he says, and my cup Overflows. You know what that means? It means I've got extra. Okay, don't get nervous about that. It just means that God gives us everything we need, and hello, He will give us extra. That's going to be the week we're talking about giving. Some of you are like, tell me the week so I don't come. But I'm telling you, if you want the extra of provision in your life, part of that is like preparing for extra. And so God gives to us, and then he gives us extra, but hello, the extra is for those in need around us. That's who the extra is for. And so he's like, your cup overflows, my cup overflows. And how does he do that? How does he make our cup overflow? Well, I don't know, because the Lord is my shepherd, and he makes me, and he leads me and he restores me and guides me and protects me and comforts me and anoints me. That's how all of these things happen. And then he goes on and he says, surely goodness and mercy follow me. I want you to notice, we're going to get to this when we get there, but just notice he's not going, hey, one day goodness and mercy will follow me. He's like, goodness and mercy follow me. There's a confidence in being in the family of God. Goodness and mercy follow me or shall follow me. So he's saying in the future, but also he's saying in the now, follow me all the days of my life. So just a heads up, this is, this is not two characters like goodness and mercy. This is not Christian Halloween where it's like, okay, you dress up as good, goodness, you dress, dress up as mercy. You know, like you you go ahead and follow. Who do you want to be? Okay, I'm going to be goodness today. Okay, I'll be mercy. No, do you know who goodness and mercy is? God is goodness and mercy. And it says he's following us. But what's crazy, I don't know if you're catching that, but it also says he leads us. But he's also following us. So he's going before us and he's coming behind us. And so hello, the shepherd is all around us. He is with us. And then it says, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So let me ask you, why why wouldn't you want him to be your shepherd? You got another shepherd maybe. Why wouldn't you want him to be the shepherd? If you've never read Psalm 23 or maybe you have, And maybe you've been on a farm before. Maybe you've worked on a farm. Here's probably what you know about sheep. You're not going to get it necessarily just with a cursory view of of reading the scripture. But the more you read it, the more you realize, oh, he's saying this. But what what you realize, especially when you get on a farm, is that that sheep, while they are cute and cuddly, they are smelly. And you get up close and they bite. And so... When I read Psalm 23, when I, when I pray it as a prayer every, every morning, very quickly the Lord's like, this is your psalm, John. Because, like, you look good from, like, 25 feet, John. Like, you look cleaned up and you got your act together. But you get in close. This is why some of you don't want to be in community. 
That's five sermons from now, okay? <laughs> but once you get in close, you realize I'm a mess. I'm fractured. I need a shepherd. And the question that should be rising, especially if you're new to church, is how do I know I can trust the shepherd? This is why you, you default to you as the shepherd, because you're like, well, I know I can trust me. Well, let me tell you, there's nobody that's betrayed you more than you, okay? But how do you know you can trust the good, perfect shepherd? I mean, how do you know he's going to lead you to greener pastures, still waters, when you can't see them because you're stuck in the dust bowl? In fact, do you know um, how they brought an end to the, the dust bowl? Do you know how they, what brought the great plains uh, out of the Dust Bowl. The, the idea came from one of, well, Roosevelt takes, takes credit, but clearly he was not a scientist. It was one of his advisors. One of his advisors suggested planting 200 million trees all the way from Canada to Texas. They called it the shelter belt. And the idea was that if you plant enough trees, it will block the wind and it will create condensation in the land that had dried out and they said it would become the lungs of the land, like the Amazon is the lungs of the world. And here's the thing, it actually worked. It's crazy. I love that story so much because this, this is what God does for us. He looks at us in the dust bowl and he steps in and he plants a tree. But the tree is the cross. And he's like, every bad decision, every sin, every, everything that has created the mess of the dust bowl of your life, he's like, I'm going to plant the solution right in the middle of it. And the one that's going to pay the price for your loss, for your mess, for your rebellion, he's then going to come off the cross alive, and he's then going to be your shepherd. Because he looks over the land, he sees sheep, and he says... They are in need of a good shepherd. That's what our God does for us.